Hello to our audience around the world. Thanks for joining us today for a webinar on mobile's end-to-end -end impact on travel. Today's webinar is presented by Sabre, and it is co-hosted by Expedia. I'm Sean O'Neill, editor of T-News in the Philadelphia area. Gene Quinn, CEO of T-News, is in Connecticut producing today. We're also joined by Martin Cohen in Margate, England. You'll be hearing from our presenters from Sabre and Expedia very shortly. Just a bit of housekeeping. Three things. First, within about a day's time, T News will email you a video replay of today's webinar. You'll also get the slides by email. You can share the video and slides with your colleagues. Second, we will have a question and answer session at the end. If you have a question, please use the box on your GoToWebinar dashboard and type in the question. I'll read the questions at, and give them to our presenters during the session. Third and last thing, we're asking some poll questions of the audience today. Your answers will help us adjust our presentation to better match who's listening. So please answer the questions. Our first poll is, where are you located? Are you in North America, Europe, Latin America, or Asia Pacific? Now, given the time difference, I know people are reaching us all over the world, and so we expect that we'll have more in North America and Europe than in Asia, but uh, we know from the number of people who have registered in advance that many people will be watching the replay and getting the slides um, in uh, some other parts of the world. Wherever you are joining us today, we thank you very much. About half of you are in North America, 40% are in Europe, uh, and for those of you in Latin America and Asia Pacific, thank you so much for joining us today. We have one more question, and then we'll dive into the webinar. If you could please tell us what business segment you're in. What travel business segment do you represent? Are you a supplier, such as in air, hotel, cruise, tours and activities? Are you an intermediary, an OTA, an agency, a TMC? Are you a tech provider? Are you a consultant or have offered professional services or something else? We would. Uh, I know our presenters have a few options, and they'll tailor some of what they say and, and, and some of the things we address based on our audience. It appears that about a third of you are tech providers. A third are intermediaries, such as OTAs, agencies, and TMCs. About 12% uh, are suppliers. 9% are consultants and, and others. Uh, regardless of, of, of where you're at, um, thank you so much for joining us. I mean... Uh, the, these these results show a lot of people are interested in mobile, particularly tech providers and intermediaries. Um, do these poll results sort of make sense to you? Uh, um, uh, 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 some of my colleagues, I'm going to be asking them uh, in, in a brief moment, but I should. Pro uh, I, the appropriate thing would be for me to introduce them first. So we have two great presenters today. We have Mark McSpadden of Sabre Labs, um, and we also have Akshaya Morali. Head of Product for Mobile Shopping at Expedia. Uh, Mark, uh, uh, as you're about to bring in your presentation, does it make sense to you that a lot of tech providers and intermediaries would be interested in, in the shape of where mobile is going today? Uh, you, you bet, Sean. We'll talk a little bit more about, about why that is, but not surprising at all to see uh, people interested in that space. Cool. Well, I'll hand it over to you to do the presentation. Uh, as, we can, as our guests can see, we'll be covering mobile trends and testing travel on mobile, as well as diving into some of the future tech that is coming to mobile and affecting the supply chain end to end. And then we'll do our Q&A. And I, again, encourage everyone in the audience to please type in your questions. Uh, we want to have a lively Q&A at the end. So over to you, Mark. All right, so we're going to spend some time talking about uh, mobile trends, some of the, the broader perspective of what we're seeing in the mobile space. And if we go to the next slide, uh, we can just see the progression of how much time people are spending on their mobile devices as a percentage of total internet time. So this green bar here that you see growing from 2008 to uh, 2015 shows the amount of time that people are spending online on mobile devices versus other devices. And uh, 2015, we surpassed the 50% mark of people are spending most of their time that they're spending online is on a mobile device, and that is across work and home. So we talk about the 
the makeup of the audience here, technology uh, providers uh, making up a big percentage of that. The reason technology providers are interested in this is because now it has become a primary use case. It's not a small percentage of what's going on anymore. It's not kind of relegated out to the fringes. Uh, this is a major piece of how people uh, interact online. And so uh, mobile is consuming uh, our time and our use cases. The stat here, this is from uh, KPCB Mary Meeker's Internet Trends Report, uh, over three hours a day per user spent on a mobile device. Uh, so that's a lot of time and a lot of functionality, a lot of jobs that we're calling on the mobile device to do. So one of those jobs, if we move on to the next slide, um, is uh, opening email. This used to be something that only happened on your desktop or your laptop. And in 2015, um, some reports saying that over 50% of email opens are happening on a smartphone, um, over 32% on the desktop or 16% on the tablet. This just highlights the fact that the, the mobile device is not just a browsing entertainment device. It's not just for YouTube, it's not just for music, it's for getting things done, for researching, it's for creating content, it's for consuming all different types of content. And we see that by the number of, of emails that are open on those devices. So if we go to the next slide, how does uh, travel booking stack up against those stats? And honestly lags a little bit behind, but still is on the rise and makes up now uh, an interesting percentage. Uh, this report shows uh, 25% of the online travel revenue coming from uh, transactions happening on mobile devices. I've seen uh, stats that studies that show a little higher than that, 30. I've seen some bold predictions up to 50. I haven't seen as much statistical support for it yet. Uh, but this is where this trend is heading, is that people are using their mobile devices for, for all kinds of tasks, and one of those is researching and booking travel. If we go to the next uh, slide, though, we're going to go into a poll question because uh, mobility is about more than just a mobile smartphone. And so I'm going to kick it to Sean to ask a question of a poll on wearable devices. Thanks, Mark. Yes, I'll handle that uh, now. We hope everyone please to please vote in this poll that you're going to see on your screen. Um, are you using wearables? Yes or no? And while we're waiting for the results, Mark, when you've quoted these statistics about mobile, we have a question from Bill, one of our attendees. Are, are the statistics including uh, tablets as well as smartphones, as well as wearables, those statistics you were just using? I know you had fine print on uh, them, the, but for people who couldn't see the fine print. Right. The, uh, the, the original one, the first one on mobile usage, does include tab tablets. Um, the email one split out a tablet separately. I'm not sure on the third one on the revenue. Uh, I'll have to go look back. Um, but tablet makes up a, a fairly small percentage of these things still. Okay, that's that that's helpful as a broad brush, and and we'll be sending the slides out uh, to everyone afterwards so they can look at the fine print. Thanks everyone for voting. Uh, two thirds of you are saying you're not using wearables, but a third are. Uh, given we we given the kind of audience who is who's listening to this type of webinar, are those results sort of in line with what you'd expect, Mark? Uh, they are in line. If you if you think back to if for technology providers, the technology adoption curve where you have 3% of people that are innovators, 12 or so percent of people that are uh, uh, early adopters, and then a bigger percent that's early majority, I think that's where we're getting up that adoption curve, not quite past the 50% tipping point, but we're definitely into the, to the main meat of that adoption curve. And so as we look at wearables and how they impact travel, um, smartwatches, I think, are becoming a really interesting play here. Uh, for, for one is that they're being adopted um, and at a rate that's a, a little bit surprising to a lot of people. Uh, the first year the Apple Watch was in production, it sold more, they sold more Apple Watches than when they released the iPhone. Uh, they sold 14 million smart uh, Apple Watches over the first year of production, which is more than they sold of iPhones uh, the first year, which is uh, just really interesting. And so if we go to the next slide, why are people 
uh, putting these devices on every morning. And the, the kind of primary use case is around is centered around this glanceable information. This idea that while you're traveling, while you're on the go, it's really helpful to have things like delays and gate changes show up on your wrist so that you don't have to pull your phone out of your pocket to see where your gate is or that you've been delayed. A trip case, a product from Savers, uh, was one of the early launch partners on Apple Watch, is across many of these devices. And it's a use case that we see uh, playing out very prevalent uh, in that space. So if we head to the next slide, we can see that what we're starting to see is some of the more advanced devices, even having GPS in the watch itself, so that you can go for a run in, in the city you may be located in, that you may have flown into, uh, go for a run and get directions on your watch. You can leave your phone at home, go for a run and have turn by turn directions because of the GPS embedded directly into the watch. And then if you go to the next slide, this idea of more advanced functionality around the watches, which is a concept Apple calls handoff. Uh, Google does something similar on their Android Wear devices, is that you may start something on your watch. You may get a notification. This glanceable information may appear on your watch, but the watch may not be the right device to execute on that information. And so handoff is a way to send uh, that to notification uh, directly in your phone very easily, which brings us to kind of the next piece of this going from mobile phone to talking about smartwatches, and then on the next slide to talk about omni-channel, because moving between your watch and your phone is one thing, but that's kind of not enough anymore, is that we're seeing multiple devices uh, that you interact with uh, on a daily basis. Interesting that one of the questions that came in was about tablet. Um, even though it makes up a small percentage, the people that have them use them as part of their repertoire of devices. And so being able to, to keep in sync across devices like your watch, your phone, your tablet, even into your TV or sometimes into your car, we've seen these mobile operating systems extend up to there, uh, becomes a really interesting way to make a seamless experience for the traveler, whether they're in the early inspiration stage and just shopping um, and trying to be inspired to all the way to in-trip and post-trip, uh, providing a great experience for them. And so with that, I'll hand it back to Sean, uh, having given kind of a, a broad overview of what's happening in the mobile space as it relates to travel. Thanks a lot, Mark. And can you briefly explain what Sabre Labs uh, does, what, what it is that you're up to over there? Yeah, great. Uh, so Sabre Labs is a group that's uh, it's a dedicated group within Sabre that looks across travel, and we explore uh, capabilities, technologies, and trends that we believe will impact travel over the next decade. We're actively researching them, we're experimenting with them, um, and then we're sharing what we learn with uh, our, our internal uh, teams, our customers, and the industry across the world. Okay, and how do you define a wearable? Uh, how do you find a wearable? Uh, we've seen lots of different wearables. Most of the applications we're seeing today are wrist-based wearables, so an activity tracker, a smartwatch. Um, these are the main use cases. We've seen some things, like uh, there was a, a device called Ringly, and so it was a ring that would light up when you got SMS messages, and it could light up different colors for different people. Uh, we've also seen some smart fabrics that as you wear them, they can take some biometric information from you. These are much more kind of on the fringe of that, kind of down the middle wearable is either an activity tracker like a Fitbit or something like that, or a smart watch like an, an Apple Watch, a Pebble, an Android Wear or Samsung device. All right, thanks. We had a couple of questions from the audience. I appreciate you with that. And now we move the presentation over to testing travel on mobile, what the experience of Expedia has been. We have Akshaya Murali, Head of Product for Mobile Shopping, joining us from San Francisco. Over to you, Akshay. Hello, and good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for the introduction, Sean. Um, with Mark's overview on mobile trends, let's dive right into the landscape of mobile at Expedia. Next slide, please. So the teams at Expedia are extremely committed to bringing the same great shopping experience to our customers optimized for whichever device they choose to use. Uh, we strive in providing the best travel experience. Uh, and very much in line with what Mark talked about, 
our users are very omnichannel. They use our website, they use our mobile app on tablet, on phone, as well as the watch. In fact, 55% of our shoppers use at least two or more devices when they're looking for travel. Next slide, please. If you look at where our users are booking, it'll help to give you a little bit of background. Our apps have been downloaded over 130 million times globally, and that number just continues to grow as we expand our coverage. Um, Expedia exists on all these platforms. So we're on, like I mentioned, desktop, phone, tablets, and even wearables. Over 40% of all of Expedia Incorporated's traffic in 2015 came from just pure mobile platforms. And this number continues to grow. We see such a strong growth in mobile app usage, but that's completely in line with the macro trends of popularity that Mark alluded to earlier. Coming up next, we have a poll, so I'll hand it over to Sean. Thanks a lot. Our next poll is about how many travel apps do you have on your phone? You could please uh, let us know, is it one or two, three or four, more than five? How many travel apps do you have on your phone? This is a question that sort of, uh, it gets to something that a lot of travel suppliers and intermediaries are worried about and concerned about. And there's been lots of predictions and talk about what, how mobile behavior will actually shake out. And obviously it constantly changes as the uh, uh, systems and platforms change. Um, it appears that about half of you are, have more than five uh, travel apps on your phone, travel specifically, uh, where about a quarter of you have what, one or two and another quarter have about three or four. Um, so back to you, Akshaya. Oh, fantastic. I mean, over half of them have over five apps, which I think is uh, pretty impressive. Um, I think it's, it's uh, worth talk, discussing the array of travel apps that people actually consider. They could be maps, they could be currency converters, they could be language dictionaries, in addition to more standard airline or uh, online travel agent apps. What we focus on at Expedia is to ensure that the tools that customers use are most easily available in our app. Of course, we're not looking to be all things for all people. We have a lot of work to do, uh, but we want to be a helpful tool um, in the entire travel process. So talking about um, a little bit about the app and what we provide is our app is all about a simple, quick, and convenient experience. Uh, we bring uh, nearby hotels tonight front and center for users to help find deals. Our itineraries product uh, provides the latest trip details and critical alerts when you're actually in trip. We notify users with things like flight delays, gate changes, baggage claim information, as well as hotel checkout reminders. Our hotel shopping path uh, provides plenty of ways to find that perfect hotel with all the savings and exclusive deals that you can snag. If you move over to the next slide, our app flight product is designed to help our users to find that perfect flight for that vacation. We want to surface best combinations of prices and layovers, and we want to bring that information front and center to our users. In 2015, we launched rental cars on the app with free cancellation and almost nearly instant bookings, so customers have the ultimate flexibility in booking. A great example of this is when I took a trip to Orlando, my flight landed, I turned on my phone to check for rental cars. I found a great car at an awesome price and I booked it right from the flight and I went to rental car desk to pick up my car. Activities are a huge opportunity in the app today. We're all about bringing that complete travel experience for our users and there's no better way to offer this to our customers than to help them find things to do when they are on their vacation. If we move to the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about travel journey. And it's not just about being available on mobile. Mark alluded to this earlier. It's about meeting the needs of, our, of your customers on all these devices. Users when traveling, they heavily use our itinerary product and providing valuable information like check-in reminders, flight delays, are super useful for our users. 
our users love this hub. We also use relevant push notifications to inform travelers of information that's relevant to their in-trip experience. We, it helps keep our users engaged, but we're just starting to test here. Thinking about global, and if you move over to the next slide, Expedia has such a huge global presence. It's very critical to cater to the needs of all these global users. We have users in over 75 countries, and what that means is we have to support many different global payment options. Talking specifically about mobile payments on the next slide, in addition to just supporting global payment types, mobile scenarios open up a unique effective way of payment for us. A big initiative we launched earlier this year was Apple Pay. And Apple Pay provides us that frictionless booking experience that our app has yet to see. I clocked a test booking about 30 seconds all the way from home page to booking confirmation. It was literally that simple. Leveraging the security, leveraging simplicity, and the convenience of Apple Pay is something that we love and we hope our customers will do. This is not live in the US, but we will expand to other countries over the course of this year. Moving to the next slide is we, considering our users are so omnichannel and they shop across various devices, following our users across these devices is super important. If you are a user using multiple devices, we don't want you to start over each time. And that's what we try and solve with Scratchpad. We capture content for you across platforms and we make it readily available for you to consume, just so you can pick up exactly where you left off. Talking about test and learn at Expedia, which is on the next slide, it's interesting to decide how we do and how we know what the right thing to build is. And well, we don't have to guess. Our users tell us. In fact, test and learn is the primary way Expedia operates. We are, we are interested in user trends, new technologies. We come up with a hypothesis. We apply it. We analyze the results. And then we move forward from there. In fact, over the past five years, our test velocity is about 30x times. Over to the next slide, being present in the mobile ecosystem, our process is slightly different from the website because the nature of pushing out releases is different. We work with our device manufacturers, we work with our partners to review code, and then we ship it out. So testing effectively operates a little more slowly. But as mobile becomes more and more prevalent, so have the testing capabilities. It's been super interesting to see the advancements in the space. With that, I will wrap it up and over to you, Mark, to look at the future. All right, I, I love being able to kind of start talking broadly about some of these trends and then see how a leader in our space has been able uh, to implement them and how they, they actually play out when they they hit the ground. Um, so taking where we are right now in this space and rolling forward a little bit, as I mentioned earlier with Sean, my the team that I run, our job is to look into the future of these trends and these technologies to see what the future might hold for them. And so if we go so the, the next slide, we're going to be looking at the way that we can extend mobile out to the future, the way that wearables and smartwatches extend out to the future, and then what the future of omni-channel uh, might be like. And the first, we start back with the mobile device. Uh, a big emphasis we're seeing on voice. Uh, on the Android platform, one in five searches is happening via voice. Just this week, Google announced, while it's not a mobile device, they have an in-home device they're rolling out to compete with the Amazon Echo that just responds to your voice. This idea of talking to your devices is becoming more and more uh, prevalent. And it's interesting because generationally it's happening on kind of both ends of the spectrum is we see very experienced travelers that have been traveling a long time like the idea of not having to type on the small keyboards. And then we see a, a younger generation which Google did a survey over a year ago now that found over 40% uh, of all teenagers were using voice 
on a daily basis. So a lot of momentum behind uh, using voice as a way to interact with your phone. I put that on top of the fact that uh, Siri, Apple just opened up the Siri platform for you to be able to develop on top of that. I think it's going to be a, a very interesting space to watch to see how, um, what are the travel use cases that start via voice on your mobile device? Is it inspiration? Is it shopping? Is it booking? Is it uh, asking questions about your destination? What are the things you're going to be asking your phone instead of typing in? We move on and see the way that the mobile device is changing the travel landscape on the next slide is that um, it's actually being used as a virtual reality device. I would not have uh, projected this five years ago at all, uh, but Samsung has really put a lot of work into uh, using the mobile phone as a virtual reality device when paired with their a gear VR headset. And so you have seen Samsung do Super Bowl commercials. Uh, I've seen billboards in city centers across the world advertising Samsung uh, VR, and that virtual reality is powered by your mobile device. So the idea that kind of virtual reality could almost always be with you. And in travel, we're seeing virtual reality be used in inspiration. We're starting to see a level of what's uh, what we're calling product level virtual reality. So United, uh, when they rolled out their new Polaris business class, had a whole virtual reality environment built for it so that you could uh, navigate and experience that space uh, before you book it. And then we've also seen some kind of pure entertainment plays on these devices. Aquantis had a program they were offering these, kind of like you hand out headsets uh, in first class. They offered uh, these virtual reality devices to consume content, whether it be movies, or more interactive content. So that's a look at what we're seeing on mobile, but as we extend out to what the future of wearables might be, I think this next poll question is really interesting and I'll throw it back to Sean for that. All right, thanks Mark. Um, last poll question for today, would you ever share your biometrics information for a better travel experience? Would you ever share your so biometrics, biometrics information? Sorry, go ahead Mark. The biometrics, we're talking about heart rate, potentially blood pressure, what you ate earlier in the day, how many steps you've taken. Are those the things you would share? Okay, it appears about half of you. Sorry about that, but it appears that maybe half of you say maybe it depends what's in it for me. 22% uh, say yes, and 32% say no. Um, how, now, we have a particular set of very interested travel and tech people who are on this webinar. Do, do those results sort of make sense for you, Mark? Uh, they're actually a, a little, I, I might have thought there might have been more no's in this group. Um, it's kind of a polarizing issue, but an, an interesting uh, interesting results here for sure, because um, if, we, if we go back to the slide set, as, we, as I look forward on the future of smartwatches, uh, I think the the amount of biometric information is really interesting. When you think about what uh, what a piece of data can do, I look at biometric data as to smartwatches and activity trackers, what GPS was to the mobile device. If you think about your mobile device and all your smartphone and all of the apps that exist on it and are better, because they know your location, one piece of information, because they know that piece of information, these applications can be significantly better. I think we will find that on biometrics and smartwatches. In fact, right now, I'm using an application that monitors my heart rate while I'm doing presentations. Like that is what the application does, and I'm willing to give up that piece of biometric information because I think it's cool. I think it helps me understand how I present and understand uh, all the things about me. So as we shift that to a travel context, what are the things we could learn from having biometric information? Could you know that a flight had gone kind of bad by biometric information, aggregate information of people throughout the cabins? Could you know that someone had a really restful night, a calm night of sleep and be able to address them differently than someone in your hotel that maybe had a really rough night or maybe a really exciting night? Uh, some really interesting questions. And this question to would you share this, what we find is people time and time again are willing to share personal information 
if they get better perceived service out of it. That's what I think you see in the the poll result of maybe depending on what what's in it for me. And so our our in travel is to create better experiences that utilize this information. And I'm excited to see what comes in that space. So as we go on to the next slide and kind of move into to talking about what's the future of omni-channel. Omni-channel kind of right now kind of means devices, spreading ourselves across different devices. We're seeing a growing trend though to spreading ourselves against uh, multiple platforms and those platforms are messaging platforms. So um, interested that we have a good global representation here on the call because depending on where you are, you're using one of these messaging apps. This chart here shows uh, global monthly active users. And so WhatsApp uh, has a billion monthly active users. Uh, this chart's a little bit old, a few months old, and Facebook Messenger has now said they're over a billion monthly active users. If you head to, to East, if you head to, to Asia, to QQ Mobile, and WeChat, these are major players uh, in these regions and lots of people on these messaging platforms. And so the idea is to meet people on the platform that they're on. That's what Omnichannel is all about, is meet, meet your users, meet your travelers where they are. And so how can we step into these messaging platforms and provide service, provide functionality, provide uh, even shopping and inspiration? So if we go on to the next slide, we can talk about uh, one in particular, uh, Facebook Messenger earlier this year uh, announced their platform to allow you to build uh, messaging, what they call bots, on top of the platform, which are uh, kind of an automated back and forth, is that it can understand the language that you use and can respond uh, with relevant posts and responses. And we've seen uh, travel adopt this very quickly, especially on the sh shopping front. Um, Expedia here on the call has uh, one of the better bots in the space that our lab has explored uh, for shopping and exploring uh, destinations. And so we're interested to see how travel continues to utilize this, whether it be on a shopping use case or on a service and support use case. We've done uh, quite a bit of work in the lab of exploring what's it like to interact with a bot when I need to know uh, where my gate is or if my flight's been delayed or where my hotel is. And so those are some of the ways we're looking at mobility and travel. If we go on to the next slide, um, I really encourage you here on the webinar, if you haven't downloaded the full report, this is just kind of the top layer of some of the things we're thinking about in the space. This report uh, goes into great depth of what many, many of us in travel are thinking about uh, the mobile ecosystem and how uh, it impacts travel. So I definitely download that report to go more in depth on some of the things you've heard here today. Fantastic, Mark. And we have uh, uh, several questions from the audience. We encourage everyone who is listening to type in a question and we thank everyone who's already submitted some questions. Uh, I'm about to bring um, uh, Martin in to help join the conversation, but uh, bef before I do, we have one question from the audience room, uh, Alex Bainbridge. Um, on the web, suppliers will complete, compete with OTAs directly, as all websites are sort of equally accessible. But on mobile, there's sort of like a, a smaller screen space, there's a different behavior pattern. Uh, presumably, many uh, users will not want to have 20 supplier apps on there. Uh, mobile device. Um, will will mobile sh adjust the OTA slash supplier balance? I don't know if either uh, Mark or Akshay have a uh, sort of a thought about the balance of power and 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 in in how people people's preferred platform for accessing travel content. Uh, so what what we're seeing is that. Um, there is there is some shift, but it's not it can't be all at once uh, because uh, the suppliers still provide. There's some reasons that I have supplier apps on my phone that um, like getting a boarding pass, like that's still something that uh, many uh, third party providers haven't implemented yet. And so if I'm flying a certain airline, I'll download that app so I can get my boarding pass. I, I think that there's a ways to go before you see full functionality because 
it's a big space trying to span everywhere from inspiration and shopping to operational, uh, whether it's get you on a plane or get you in a room at a hotel. Like it's a big space to span. And I, it, if it were to happen, it's still a long ways coming. Okay, fantastic. Uh, Martin, do you do you have something you'd like to say? Well, it's just a, a, a general comment and observation, having worked on the paper with um, Sabre and Expedia, and it's one one thing that sometimes I think is is overlooked in that, you know, the first iPhone was only launched less than ten years ago, and you think of the the way in which it's it's changed our lives and travel in such a relatively short space of time. That's why I'm quite interested in Mark's. Um, comments and observations around smartwatches and biometrics. I mean, these these technologies um, are, are are virtually new. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but the Apple Watch is is less than a year old. So if you think much has changed as a result of the iPhone, I mean, what what can wearables do over the next two or three years? I think sometimes we we tend to forget the speed at which everything is moving because we're so caught up in it. And certainly the the, the, the slide around biometrics I thought was was fascinating where one, one in five of the audience is, is quite prepared to give up what what would have been seen as quite personal information, um, willing to give it up in, in exchange for a better travel experience. And I think that's a really positive thing for for the travel industry, particularly companies such as Sabre and Expedia that are really, you know, experimenting and looking deeply at the, the travel use cases for these new and emerging technologies. Now, Martin, you've uh, mentioned in the, beha- beha- in the past, you know, what are the chances of there being one travel app to rule all of mobile? Um, uh, Ak- Akshaya, do you, do you think that's likely or, or doubtful? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, um, I don't believe there is one travel app to rule the world. Um, and effectively, we see it slightly differently at Expedia. What we see is we're having great access with the Expedia app, and some of our most loyal customers are engaging really deeply on our app. Um, like I mentioned before, you know, we cannot provide all of the value. Um, and of course, we have a lot of work to do there. But we want to provide the best tools, of, uh, tools that our users can use. And to be really focused, we want to be uh, providing those customers with the content they need the most, rather than focusing on what others are doing in the space. That that makes sense. Uh, our, our audience members have several rapid fire questions for Expedia, so uh, it's it's the rapid fire round. Um, is is Apple Pay available in Asia, uh, for example, uh, in, in China or Southeast Asia, uh, for the Expedia platforms? Amelia is asking this question. That is a great question. So Apple Pay at the moment is live in the U.S. and we will be testing and learning our way into all the other markets. We'll be working with Apple to identify what that schedule looks like and you will uh, hear about it soon. Right. Uh, Daria is wondering whether Expedia plans to test out a Facebook Messenger bot. I I actually thought Expedia does have one, but I may have missed. Yeah, of course. I will. I'm happy to answer that. So, predictive modeling, machine learning, uh, natural language processing are all things that Expedia is experimenting with. I'm not specifically on the team that works on the Expedia bot, Facebook Messenger, but it is absolutely one of our most recent addition to the natural language natural language processing world. Um, our customers using Facebook Messenger can interact with an Expedia bot to fulfill their hotel search request. Of course, the bot operates on a very structured conversation flow. It analyzes the information, prompts the user with other relevant data points to complete that search. But we're continuing to test and learn in this space, and it's a very, very uh, trending space. So one follow-up on that is, you know, for many years we've talked about how travel brands need to be mobile first. They need to think in terms of how their consumers are and all their products are can work in a mobile first way. Um, is AI first the next concept? So we are actively looking at all of these upcoming trends. I know Mark talked about uh, messenger boards, uh, AI is upcoming, NLP is on the horizon, Um, but I do think that as these trends grow up, um, it'll be something that we'll be experimenting and learning with. 
So Noah is wondering a question uh, about Expedia. So when you say frequency is two times uh, greater average users in your app, what does that mean? Are you seeing double the purchase frequency as well in conversion? All right, uh, can you just repeat that? I think I lost you guys for just a bit. Sure. Uh, so a question from Noah for Expedia. When you when you say that frequency is, 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 is double uh, or greater than two times average uh, for users in your app, um, on, on mobile. What does that mean? Are you seeing double the purchase frequency as well? So, uh, we don't share, uh, we don't share that type of information publicly, but what I can tell you is we're just seeing a longer usage period within our app than any other platform. And I think that's pretty indicative of how the entire ecosystem is shifting towards our users and all users being really comfortable using mobile apps and playing in that ecosystem. And, and does it, Expedia develop its mobile apps and desktop solutions on its own, or does it use solutions developed by others? Valentin is asking. Uh, so like I alluded to before, our entire teams are focused at Expedia to bring that experience across all the devices that our users use. So um, uh, entire Expedia is committed to do that. Fantastic. Um, uh, uh, some some questions uh, uh, for you, Mark. Um, you know, is payments uh, an area of explanation for Saber? Yeah, I mean, it's it's definitely something that we're looking into. We have a a, a pretty vocal investment in, in virtual payments for uh, for agencies on the corporate side. You can find a lot of what we're doing in that space on our website. As far as uh, mobile payments, things like. Uh, Apple Pay, even Facebook Messenger announced uh, a payment beta just last week. These are things we're exploring in the lab and seeing how we can get them uh, get them to work in for our customers. The the payment piece, especially on mobile, the idea is you need to remove as much friction as possible in that interaction. The idea of having to punch in your 16 digit credit card number and put in your name and your address every time you want to make an, a transaction on a mobile device uh, is a big barrier. Um, in fact, I've seen uh, some, some analytics around a different uh, shopping and booking that shows uh, what happens is sometimes someone comes in and does a search on a mobile device and then when they want to purchase, they go to the web and do that exact same search in that exact same way. Um, part of that is the payment piece. We need to, to be better about making that frictionless. Uh, if we look to other parts of the globe, WeChat uh, and their messaging platform, over 50% of businesses that are on the WeChat platform as official accounts are integrated into WeChat Pay, uh, into their payment system right there. So we see that being a direction things are headed. So, uh, uh, you push back a little bit on that. I mean, WeChat takes a commission. Apple Pay takes, you know, effectively a commission of charge for transactions. Is there anything travel suppliers need to know about those as headwinds, or is it sort of simply that this is going to become a consumer preference and default, and suppliers and intermediaries just need to to adjust? Uh, interesting enough, Facebook Facebook has been very vocal about their payments play that they will not take a commission that they are just interested, they want to be an advertising, they are an advertising platform, a huge one, and they want to understand what people are purchasing, but they don't want to get in the middle of that transaction. Um, so I, 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 I'd have to check on what Apple Pays is. I think that some of these platforms are more interested in knowing what's being purchased than making money off the purchase itself. Um, is there a strict limit on how much a client um uh, could pay for one transaction on like WeChat or, or, or an Apple Pay that sort of prevents big ticket items like travel being an option? Uh, Amelia is asking this. I haven't seen that yet, but um, definitely something we should look into. It's, it's one, of the, one of the things I say about messaging is, right, when the web first came, no one imagined spending $1,000 on a website. You would never make a $1,000 transaction on the online. But and then when mobile came out, oh, I'd never spend a thousand dollars on my mobile device. Oh, and now we're seeing that happening, and I think we're seeing the same thing. Oh, I'd never, I'd never do a thousand dollar purchase in my messaging app. And if history serves as a bridge for the future, then perhaps. Okay, cool. 
Um, Aksha, is, uh, Expedia, what technologies do you plan to offer hotel partners alongside the end user? I know in the, in the past year or two, uh, you know, Expedia's worked hard with Partner Central and, and, and beefing up the um, uh, sort of the user interface, making it more uh, tablet and mobile responsive friendly. Uh, and there's been other additional moves on, on the hotel B2B front. Is there anything you can elaborate there? Um, I can talk about it a little bit, although I'm not directly involved with the team. Um, and so that's not my area of expertise. But that is something that we constantly invest in because those relationships are very key to us. Okay. Are, are, are there any legal issues to using biometric information um, uh, through an app? Is, is that, is, what, what, what's your views on that, Akshay? Um, in terms of biometric information, I think um, it's still to be determined. Um, I know it's fairly nascent in the, uh, in the trends. Um, I know, uh, you know, huge players in the market are figuring out uh, what the needs of this market are. So I would say it's still to be determined, but much to learn. Is is there do you, do you have any sense based on the early test and learn that Expedia has done about what direction messenger bots are sort of are are going to? Is there anything of sort of any insights or surprises in consumer behavior? Uh, Brendan is asking. So messenger bots specifically um, specifically uh, in natural language processing and the way we are having structured conversations. I guess we're still at the stage where we are eager to learn, learn more. I think it's too early to make assumptions and insights into how this will shape up to be. I would also be very curious to see how other services, like Mark talked about, customer service and support really support in this case. Uh, based on what our customer inputs are in the existing implementation, we're applying to see what um, and where we can apply these things to various shopping paths. Is there an example of how personalization is, is somehow something that's been toyed with by Expedia? There's been a, an experiment that sort of brings more ex personalization, taking advantage of the mobile experience. Um, so we have a product called Scratchpad that I talked about um, in, our, in the presentation. And what it really does is tries to remember a locked-in user's uh, a journey within our ecosystem, right? It helps you uh, provide, uh, I mean, it remembers what destinations you are, and that's absolutely a first step into personalization for us. Fantastic. I'm going to bring Martin back in in a moment, but um, a couple questions for you, uh, Mark. Uh, Theodore is wondering, are there any plans on integrating digital keys into wearables, like for hotel room keys? Have you heard anything on that? Uh, yes, we did see. Um, now, I sometimes put a difference between what was announced at launch and what has actually happened. Is that Starwood was a launch partner of of, of the Apple Watch, saying that you could put the a digital key on the watch. Um, just to be completely honest, as someone who's worn one of these for uh, over a year now, is that uh, ergonomically there are some things that the watch is not good for. It's not good for your boarding pass because turning your wrist upside down to put it on a scanner is hard. Like it's not the, the way you want to do things. And so hotel keys kind of fall in that space for me of maybe they work, but uh, I've also used like a magic band at Disney and it's, it's sometimes hard to unlock, unlock your room that way. Okay. Um, uh, Martin, is there a, a, a comment on something that you'd like to, to join, join in on here? Yeah, no, I'm just interested in the in the theory and practice of omnichannel and whether there's there's a, there's a finite number of constituent parts of the on, omnichannel landscape. Whether there's a, a finite number of devices that consumers are, are willing to um, allow the travel companies to facilitate conversations between. I know um, Akshaya XB just done a lot of work work on this, but I'm just wondering if. If you know things such as you know the Internet of Things or, or virtual reality headsets are becoming part of that omnichannel experience in Expedia, and maybe Mark as well, whether you've got any you know further insights. I mean, I like the the idea that Samsung have got a, a VR headset that's controlled by the mobile phone. That's a clear a good example of of omnichannel that is um, you know w waiting for a travel use case. But just in terms of the omnichannel in general, is there a almost like a, a, a finite optimum number of devices? 
So from my perspective, uh, there may be a, a number that we settle out of devices that the traveler uses um, as an output from the travel company that they engage with, that they're getting visuals from, that they're hearing from. Um, there may be a limit there, but it may be higher than we think. Like it may be that the Amazon Echo in my house can talk to me about travel deals. Um, so it could be more than just screens in front of us. It could be things that we're hearing, things that we're experiencing. As, but I think that on the flip side, what uh, the information that could go into a travel channel, uh, when you start talking about Internet of Things, like would I like my hotel to know what, what I usually keep my Nest thermostat at at home? Like that sounds interesting to me. And so if you just expand that out to all the sensors that are uh, starting to become around my, that I engage with on a regular basis, I think that it's it's almost limitless the amount of, of information that could be coming into the travel company. It's just, there, there may be some, some physical limit of what the traveler engages with actively. That's fantastic. Um, um, uh, Martin, uh, my perspective on that, at least uh, from uh, the Expedia lens, is I think if we think about omnichannel, it is really super early in that space. But I think, but I don't think there's necessarily an optimum number of devices. I think it's more critical that you can access the content when, where, and how you want it. For example, if you're in a line at Starbucks, you should be able to pick up your phone and do a hotel search for the weekend. If you are packing for your trip, then you want to be getting a push notification uh, on your Apple Watch that will help you grab a cab to get to the airport on time. So I think that uh, it, our work overall across all of these newly surfacing trends is fairly experimental. But I do think that we should focus on just providing the right content to our users when and how they need it. Um. Akshaya, what is Expedia's take on deep linking and app streaming? Thomas is asking. Um, deep linking and app streaming are also extremely new trends in this space. Um, overall, I think uh, when we look at uh, either uh, capabilities and that different platforms provide, it's something that we are absolutely investigating and understanding how much we need to invest in. So it's something that we're strategizing on. Um, it'll be a continued area of investment for us. Um, um, we have another question about whether, is it technically possible that, and not a business strategy question, not revealing future business plans, but is it technically possible that an Expedia app could align or collaborate with chatting apps like WhatsApp and, and, and WeChat and, or, or Facebook Messenger in a way to sort of enable the e-commerce to sort of be more seamless. So getting at this, we sort of talk about omni-channel and we talk about apps, but is there, is it, is that sort of, a, is the issue a business strategy one or is it a technical one? Uh, technically, it's absolutely possible. I think the ecosystem completely supports it moving across these channels and moving across apps and moving across devices, uh, you know, technology is just making it easier and easier. Um, in terms of um, strategically, again, our philosophy is to experiment, understand what our users need, and then make those investments there. Okay. Mark, we have an Internet of Things question from Elisa. Um, can you discuss the impact of air, airport beacon technology, sort of reaching customers via mobile, assisting them in the airport experience as they walk around the gates, getting push notifications, that sort of thing? Uh, yes. So, you know, we've played with uh, these beacons for quite a while now. Um, there is a first use case, which we, we just call couponing, which is just watching, watching people as they walk around and off, sending them offers. Um, that's kind of interesting and may change a little bit of travel behavior. The idea we have is, can you make someone, when they come through the security line, turn left and go to your place instead of head right, which is where their gate is? Um, what we're a little more interested in is kind of the operational side of things, is that how can you help a supplier know whether somebody has made it through security or not, and whether they should close the door and board the plane or wait for that VIP uh, because of where they are in the location? How, how do you start doing traffic flow analysis? Things that used to take lots of time and energy to do be done kind of manually or via video to see how people move through an airport, uh, but be able to do that really efficiently. We think about 
bringing what Google Analytics has done for web traffic analytics, how do you bring that into physical places? I think that's where kind of the more interesting beacon technology uh, lies in airports and scenarios there. Okay. Um, we have a, a, some really great questions. We're going to go a couple minutes uh, past the hour just to answer, try to get some of them. We won't be able to get to all of them. Um, Daria is wondering about instant apps, and maybe Akshay, you have an opinion on this. Um, instant apps were introduced by Google uh, at the Google I/O conference. Um, what do you think about about them? Do they have a promise for people who don't want to install an app uh, and just want a one in a t once one a, once a time experience? Uh, technically, I absolutely think instant apps um, can be very valuable to our users. Um, across the board, um, they provide some really fantastic capability of being able to have a preview of what the app is all about before committing to downloading it. So I do think that uh, in terms of the technology and in terms of use cases for all the users out there, it's fantastic. Um, again, in terms of what um, what Expedia will do in this space is, um, you know, it's an upcoming trend. We'll wait and watch to see what our users want in this space and go from there. Has there been any success, uh, Akshay, with a personalization in, in the form of push notes? Was there any, tr t uh, you know, test and learn experiments that uh, ha have seen promise or actual products out in the field with Expedia? Uh, we're... At this point, we're continuously testing our push notifications. I think if you think about the entire travel journey that the user goes through, uh, the opportunities and the number of scenarios are immense. Uh, we've done a bit of testing here, but we want to be really careful about um, turning users off with push notifications that are not relevant. So because it's a very sensitive space, we take complete care on understanding what type of scenarios we want to look at. Um, so, uh, one more question, like on the technical side, you know, in order to provide personalization, uh, Lorena is wondering whether, uh, is it possible that companies, uh, either the, 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 the operator can pass along information from the mobile device that the travel brand or the, the travel brand or the intermediary can use to help personalize so that it, there's sort of a static information, a kind of like a, a blockchain kind of personal ID on the person's nationality, their guest profile, their age or something that it can be passed over either to the hotel, or the supplier can be passed over to the, used by the app in order to customize the experience. Is there any, are there, what are some sort of like in brief sort of the contours of what's, what's possible? So just to understand, I think um, it's, uh, I mean, just to clarify the question, it's talking about, or the question is around personalization based on what a user needs or a user has seen in the past. I want to make sure that I understand the question correctly. Is, is there some way to sort of passively uh, use information that's, that's, co that's collected on the mobile device and, and sort of somehow filter through what a supplier or an OTA provides the user through their apps uh, by taking advantage of that information. I'm, I'm not summarizing this question as well, but um, uh, that's what I think Lorraine is getting at. Okay. So uh, from what I understand, I think there's opportunity to know what our users want to see in the future. For example, if a, if a user has you know, looked at something that's excited them about, say, a trip to Disneyland, then we want to be sure that, you know, we're sending relevant content as long as the user has expressed interest that they would like to see uh, views on that content, right? Um, so I think there's, there's a lot in terms of opportunity to understand how personalization can better tailor content and uh, provide deals and things in that, in that space. Um, in terms of... Uh, other types of personalization, I think the more we know about our users, the more contextual we can provide them with deals. So that's where we are. All right. Uh, it's, it, this is painful for me because we have so many good questions, but uh, time is, is of the essence. What we can do is we can pass along the questions to our presenters so that they can uh, be able to respond and, and get back to you. Um, I'll, well, I'm going to have two final questions and then we'll, 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 have, to, we'll have to wrap up. Um, uh, we will also, there were several questions from the audience about the, both about Sabre's products, about what, uh, Expedia's products and the interaction between Sabre and Expedia. 
And um, for people who have those questions, uh, Mark uh, and Akshaya will be able to uh, uh, sort of answer them. You'll see their contact information on the slides and replay that are uh, will be emailed to everyone at the end of this presentation. Everyone will receive an email within 24 hours of of what um, uh, of the slides, the report that Martin has written. And uh, of the webinar replay, Martin, do you have any uh, uh, additional thoughts before we have to go? Would you like to chime in on? Um, I, I, n n yes and no. I think maybe maybe do some audience questions. I mean, I'm I'm lucky I can get to, to Mark and Akshire at any time, but maybe just try some audience questions. Yep, that's fine. Uh, my, my last two, one for one for you, Mark, is um, does the travel industry have the right um, skills to make the most of the mobile opportunity or sort of a way of flipping this question from Alex, you know, uh, uh, which, what are skills that you particularly think travel companies should be valuing when it comes to taking advantage of all these mobile options? Cause there's, there's so many of them. Yeah, I, I think uh, number one is, is keeping the end traveler in mind. The, the mobile piece lets you know more about them. You can be more in tune to where they are, where in the journey they are. You can reach them on more pieces of the journey than you could previously. And so I think I think that that access to the traveler throughout multiple steps of the journey is is the thing that you need to keep coming back to is how can I improve that experience based on where they are? Are they packing? Are they being inspired? Are they stuck in an airport? How do I serve the traveler best in that point in time? Okay. And um you know, Mark had alluded at the end of his, his session about voice commands, voice travel. We've had a few questions about uh, uh, taking advantage of tools like Amazon Alexa. Uh, does Expedia have any plans to sort of test and address these types of, of platforms? Uh, that's a great question. Um, yes, it's a great mo it's a great mobile trend. It's something, you know, we talked about earlier. Um, again, I think it's a form of AI and natural language processing. So absolutely, it's an interesting trend, and we will continue to experiment in that space. Fantastic. Well, I'm really grateful to uh, both you and Mark uh, and Martin for taking the time to speak with us. Again, I'm sorry, time is a factor. If you like today's webinar, you'll enjoy our deep dive into the topic on mobiles and end impact on travel. Uh, you can download our free report. We will be emailing you a link to the report that Martin wrote uh, uh, within 24 hours. Um, thank you again for joining us. We hope you have a happy Friday tomorrow, and uh, please uh, have a good day wherever you are.